Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum Update Monday, July 8th, 1 a.m. Mountain Time, 2019. You're looking at our sun. And this region in question popping up in the high southern latitude is very indicative of the beginning of solar cycle 25, now, we were in sunspot minimum of cycle 24, and we're waiting for 25 to begin, which is typically associated with large earthquakes and the solar polar field reversal. And we're going to show you why this sunspot, if there are others in this region that will be moving through in the coming weeks, is the kickoff of cycle 24, and that's coming soon. Stick with us. Keep calm. It's boom time. Sunspot 2744, high latitude southern position, indicative of changing sunspots. Sunspot 2744, currently AR12744 beta BXO. C spot potential 5%. M flare 1. X flare 1%. The intensity in this is waning as it turns earth facing, but when it popped up there, a day ago, it kicked off some B flares. It has quieted down since then. That's what it looked like when it turned a limb 36 hours ago. Now, let's get to the reasoning on why this is the kickoff of Solar Cycle 25. You're looking at the Maunder butterfly diagram. The construction of the sunspot butterfly diagram, which you're looking at here. This is a high-resolution butterfly diagram. I will leave you links below. You can bring this baby way in and see every single spot. So, excellent graphic for you to check out. And we're going to be talking about it shortly. But let's get into the details of what the Maunder butterfly diagram actually is. The construction of sunspot Maunder butterfly diagrams was first carried out by E.W. Maunder in 1904 and proceeds as follows. One begins by laying a coordinate grid on, for example, a solar white light or calcium image with, as in the case of geographic coordinates on Earth, the rotation axis defining the north-south vector. We're talking on the sun. The visible solar disk is then divided in latitudinal strips. The percentage of the area covered by sunspots and or active regions is calculated and color coded. And that gives you the butterfly colors. This defines a one dimensional vertical array describing the average sunspot coverage in that region at that time specifically. So it actually shows you the movement of the sunspot positions across the face of the solar disk through time and through the solar cycle. And what you get is a detailed analysis of the migration of sunspot predictability and periodicity on the face of the disk of the, sol the sun. The equator being here in the middle black line. So for the last decade, most sunspots have been converging on the equator in both directions. And we've had quite a deficit in the Southern Hemisphere for the last uh, five years. And now we have a spot kicking off near 30 South. 30 South is indicative of the kickoff of the next solar cycle based on the butterfly diagrams. Do you see that? And so what we should then see is two more uh, sunspots, one North and one South of that region. And then more and more and more all in the upper southern latitudes. So, otherwise, it's just an anomalous blip, like many that we see here during the, the minimas. There are blips that are associated with other cycles that are off, way off kilter. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this, but this is potentially because this is the time when we should be entering the next solar cycle. Our prediction was... Uh, spring of 2020. So this could be just a quick aberration or blip. We'll never know until we know. So we have to wait and see. But after two quakes shake Southern California, residents wonder, are we getting close to the big one? Do you wonder? 
Of course we are. Every single day that a big one doesn't happen on the San Andreas or Cascadia is another day closer to the big one. We've had some major activity today during potentially the solar polar reversal and the entering into solar cycle 25, 6.9 down here in Indonesia. But we're still wondering about what's happening here on the West Coast. Because not only is this earthquake activity in a tertiary uh, fault zone, what I mean by that, you have primary, secondary, and tertiary fault zones. This is not a major fault system that moves often. And that is why there are so many aftershocks. This region doesn't move in this magnitude. So when it does move in this magnitude, the ground has to recover because it is not used to this. Now, one of two things could occur. All of the pressure could be released in this zone, this vector of the tertiary fault system, or it could be translated through the secondary to the primary system, which means we would have a major fault here in the San Andreas, or it could even translate up into the Cascadia because it is in line and pressure laterally with all of these, primary, secondary, tertiary. And it's the connection of these faults that makes it that hierarchy. So, we're going to be watching this closely. If anything major happens, it would kick off in the next 24 to 36 hours based on space weather, which we will be looking at. <coughs> Here's the solar wind stream. You can see the phi angle shifting. Slightly towards 250. We're really worried about the 180 zone. Density has been increasing. We have some cosmic ray spikes occurring. Cosmic ray maximum much. And then we have the Coso Volcanic Field in California. Where there was a strong earthquake swarm, which according to news sources is no cause for concern. And the M7.1 earthquake has also triggered an earthquake swarm at the southern end of the volcanic field called the Koso Volcanic Field with around 30 earthquakes per hour. Last time this happened was 1992. And according to the powers that be, there is no concern at this time for potential volcanic unrest. In fact, this volcano hasn't erupted for millions and billions of years. Here we are over at the Koso Volcanic Field. The last known eruption is in the Pleistocene. Now, according to the Global Volcanism Program, it is not aware of any Holocene eruptions in the volcanic field. If this volcano has had large eruptions, VEI, 4 or greater, prior to 10,000 years ago. The Koso Volcanic Field is located 160 kilometers, which is about 100 miles northeast of Bakersfield, California, in the middle of being nowhere mainly within the boundary of the Naval Air Weapons Station, China Lake. And it covers approximately 400 square kilometers, which is roughly 150 square miles, and is home to one of the largest producers of geothermal power in the U.S., with an output sufficient to supply the needs of a quarter million plus homes. The geothermal resource fuels many hot springs, steam vents, and boiling mud pots near the center of the Koso volcanic fields. About 40 eruptions in the last quarter of a million years produced a field steep-sided lava domes, red hills of volcanic cinder and rough surface lava flows. The most recent eruption occurred 40,000 years ago, forming volcanic peak, basaltic cinder cone, and lava flow. However, some geologic landform relationships suggest the youngest lava dome may have formed within the past 12,000 years with no lower limit because no dating has been done, which means this baby could very well be active and a cause for concern. Are you concerned? Worldwide Volcano News Update. Popo blasting to 24,000 feet. Dukono Sanjay Api also coming into the forefront. Sabankaya Hoosier Maya, 24,000 feet. Dukono 7,000 Sangay API Volcano Ash Advisory Discrete Volcanic Ash to 7,000. And you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. Solar Panel Farm grows 17,000 tons of food without soil, pesticides, fossil fuels, or groundwater. Holy macaroni! Now we're talking progress. 
Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. And we're not talking perfection, we're talking progress. Farming is probably the world's oldest profession and something that is obviously universal to every culture and race in the world. In fact, we all came from the Garden of Eden. Yes, Saturn glowing in the northern sky, the perpetual Atum Ra, the sun god. Since the beginning of time, farming has been the backbone of any society. While the methods may differ based on such things as technology, environment, grand solar minimums, financial means, Monsanto, and other pricks, the one thing that never changes is that farming will always be a necessity. Are you farming? So anything that can safely help farmers more effectively and efficiently produce crops and livestock, we need to survive is welcome news. There is little argument that the resources needed to farm in the traditional matter, including chemical inputs, is BS. And they are finite, which means they're not infinite. But what we teach on this channel is infinite farming, infinite abundance. Yes, it's the IA, not the AI. Are you picking up what we're putting down? Yes, join us as we change history. These are just some of the pieces of the puzzle. Breaking scientific news coming out. Relationships between the solar wind magnetic field and ground level long wave irradiance at high northern latitudes. <coughs> Jesus. I don't even know what that means. I know that's what you're saying. But, and there's not even any information here, so. Kudos to you. I've requested full text for every single person in the room. So we're waiting on that. And the only reason I can do that is because I'm a member of ResearchGate as a scientist with a graduate degree listed there for decades with my articles and my abstracts. I am allowed to do that. Relationships between the solar wind magnetic field ground level long wave irradiance at high northern latitudes by Brian Tinsley, John Frederick, and Limin Zhao. Yes. This is the paper. Not a schmaper. Downward long wave radiation measured at alert Canada shows responses to the interplanetary magnetic field. What do you think that means during a magnetic reversal? Upward long wave radiation responds similarly a day later. Oh my goodness. The phenomenon is consistent with solar wind inputs to atmospheric electricity affecting cloud microphysics. Cosmic ray flux much? Svensmark was right. And now we're picking up what he's been putting down for decades. Long wave irradiance is measured from two sites at different geomagnetic latitudes show different responses to changes in the east-west component of the interplanetary magnetic field. So, as we enter the magnetic reversal or excursion and the grand solar minimum increases cosmic rays... And the magnetosphere wanes. It's anyone's guess what happens. Only it's not a guess. Whew. Cloud nucleation, flooding. Well, you'll live it, so you'll know. Winter monsoons became stronger during geomagnetic reversals. Of course they did, because cosmic rays poured in. Nucleating clouds and changing the state of the planet. New evidence suggests that high energy particles from space, known as galactic cosmic rays, affect the Earth's climate by increasing cloud cover, causing the, and you're freezing your arse off effect and we're about to wash you down into the ocean. And then breaking news coming out just now, tomorrow, Earth's ancient life forms are awakening after 40,000 years in permafrost. Holy sh... <coughs> the only problem is that they're, they then say in the next sentence, from 1550 to 1850, a, go a global cold snap called the Little Ice Age supersized glaciers throughout the Arctic. On Canada's Elsmere Island, teardrop glacier extended and frozen tongue across the landscape and swallowed small tufts of moss. Since 1850, the plant lay frozen under 100-foot-thick slabs of ice as humans discovered antibiotics, visited the moon, and burned 2 trillion tons of fossil fuels. 
suggested, quote unquote, warming the earth and in blah, blah, blah. Thanks to this latest exploit, evolutionary biologist Catherine Lafargue arrived centuries later at Teardrop Melting Edge to find the tough species Alicunium tigluntum, finally free from its icy entombment. The only problem is that this is only a few hundred years ago during the Little Ice Age. It has nothing to do with 40,000 years, what they put in the article title. Washington Post! I want to wipe my ass with your fucking paper. Guys, I hope you got something out of the video. I don't even have to poop, but it's time. The Washington Post deserves it, but you don't. You know, you deserve the facts. And the facts are solar cycle 25 may have begun. And it, it is being parsed and charsed and chucked like flucked. That's a boom. It's a boom so worthy of me actually adding the boom to the whole podcast. It's downloading now before your very lives. And that is knowledge. AR12744. Beta BXO. 5% C flare. 1% M. 1% X. Is coming soon. So it lights up, boom, right there, and then it shuts off. We'll be watching it. Is it the onset of Solar Cycle 25, or is it an aberration? It's anyone's guess. If it is the beginning of Cycle 25, you have less than three years. The markets will collapse, an X flare will hit Earth, and the grid will go down. We want you with us. We don't want to eat you. Thanks to all our one-time donors, our Patreons. Without you, we can't make this happen. Oppenheimer Ranch Project has been re-monetized. The powers that be know what's happening. We are the number one source for actual information, science-based. Join us. Are you farming 